Alright, so last week I made a video about the early years of WCW, and during that time I brought up how Cowboy Bill Watts had a very brief but controversial run in the company. But while I did bring up a few reasons as to why his run was less than successful, I didn't mention his strict code of conduct that boiled down to 10 rules which a lot of wrestlers absolutely hated. But this begs the question, what are these 10 rules and why were they such an issue? And is there any chance that they might actually make some sense? Well, that's what we're here to discuss, because today... Thank you so much for the support over on Patreon to Nigo Montoya and Ron Hawthorne. To get your own Patreon shout out, please go over and sign up on my Patreon page. Alright, so to start, let me say that I'm not here to tell you whether or not Bill Watts' rules were good or bad. It's up for you to decide for yourself. I'm just merely giving you some information to start the discussion. After all, this is the Thinking Fans channel, and therefore consider this just food for thought. And while you're in considering mood, please consider subscribing to this channel and making sure that you give this video a big like. Anyway, moving on with the video, the first thing I have to say before we get into any of the rules is that Bill Watts, as previously covered on this channel, is a big believer in kayfabe. And with that, one of the first controversies you could say about these rules is that the line between kayfabe and reality is somewhat blurred and it's hard to distinguish between the two. And to confound the issue even more, Bill Watts laid out a list of rules on television in character that may or may not work in tandem with these backstage rules. Uh, you know what, you'll see what I mean. Let's just, let's get into the first entry. Use of the barricades and ring posts is forbidden and will cause for an automatic disqualification. Okay, so first, know that this is indeed a backstage rule. However, the consequence is a kayfabe one with disqualification being the only punishment. And so this is why a lot of people tend to mix up the authentic and the inauthentic with this whole situation. But the whole thing makes a lot more sense when you stop to think about it. For example, if you're doing something that's a blatant violation right in front of the referee, well, why isn't he disqualifying you? Now sure, on TV, we're all kinda used to seeing tight shots where we only see the action, but when you're live, everyone can plainly see that there's a referee standing right there and doing nothing about blatant violations. So, in a world of OMG moments from WWE video games, we do tend to forget that some of these things really should be counted as disqualifications. For example, in a standard match, if you brought a table into the ring and used it, that would be grounds for disqualification. However, if you put someone through the announce table outside of the ring, no one says anything. And it should be the exact same thing when it comes to ring posts and guardrails. If this was a legitimate wrestling contest, there's no way you could use any of these items. Imagine a boxing match where a boxer takes his opponent outside the ring and smashes him into the post. You can, can you? Because it would be absolutely ridiculous. But for some reason, we just accept this in professional wrestling, even though we probably shouldn't. So the thinking here is to try and make wrestling seem more legitimate legitimate, it should have some sort of rule assemblance. But at the same time, there are a lot of people out there who will say that this is professional wrestling. It's not professional boxing or MMA or anything like that. A lot of this just comes with the territory and it's fun and it's part of the reason why they're watching in the first place. Anyway, let's go on to that second rule. Wrestling outside the ring is discouraged. Now, in order to further dissuade this, there were those on-air kayfabe rules that I talked about earlier, and the biggest one would have to be no moves off the top rope. Fans just hated that. Oh, and also, taking your opponent and throwing them over the top rope was considered an instant disqualification as well. Oh, but allow me to reiterate that these were on-air kayfabe rules, and Watts himself acknowledged this, as well as acknowledging just how much the fans hated it. And I know the top rope rule has been very, very controversial. We want your opinion, and we're going to let you vote on a big primetime special. The top rope rule, as of today, is rescinded completely in World Championship Wrestling. And again, the thought process here was trying not to expose the business. After all, it does seem rather strange that referees take so long to count to 10 whenever wrestlers go outside the ring. But just like with the last entry, it's really important to listen to the specific verbiage used here. It's said that wrestling outside the ring is discouraged, not forbidden. And so, just like the last rule, it's not that you can't do these things, just don't get caught doing them and don't blatantly do it in front of the referee because you're making him look bad by not DQing you. Because if you want wrestling to have more of a sports 
space presentation, well, it would really help if you treated it as such. Oh, and just in case you didn't have enough motivation to stay inside the ring, there was another layer added. Or should I say another layer taken away, as there was a strict no mats, no padding rule for the outside. And this was definitely met with some backlash. As there were those who said that having no padding whatsoever on the outside, just pure concrete, made taking bumps really painful and could lead to injury. However, again, the answer to this was, if you don't go outside, that won't be a problem. And again, outside the ring wrestling was discouraged, not forbidden. Although, to counter this, there were some who would argue the other way, as they felt that landing on a soft mat and landing on something that wasn't solid ground could lead to more ankle injuries. Regardless, allegedly, the level of thinking here was that WCW was not going to be the cartoon that WWF was, and that real men and real wrestlers don't need padded mats. And while WWE's current outside the ring presentation does look a lot more clean and a lot more professional, at the same time it does also kind of look like a giant playpen. So again, this is yet another judgment call. Do you keep padding outside to keep the wrestlers safe, or should they not even be going out there in the first place? Hmm, tough call. Absolutely no low blows. First offense is a $1,000 fine, second offense is a $2,500 fine, and the third offense is a $5,000 fine, and will be considered a breach of contract. If a wrestler is hit low, he is to make every effort not to sell the move as a low blow. Alright, so just like the other two entries, the important thing is don't get caught doing any of these things. Don't do them right in front of the referee and don't make him look bad. However, unlike the last two rules, you notice that this one has a real world consequence in the form of some pretty hefty fines. So why does this one have such a big bill? Now, I'm sure trying to maintain the honor and integrity of professional wrestling by not doing things like low blows is a part of it. But as good old Jim Ross said when talking about these rules, a lot of it has to do with wrestlers taking shortcuts and beginning to rely on certain methods as something of a crutch. Things like creating separations or even motivations for getting angry are very important when it comes to professional wrestling. But if they're done too much, then they kind of water down the experience for whenever they happen. And while, yeah, there are some things that are going to be constantly repetitive when it comes to professional wrestling, like punching, something like a low blow should have a major impact, as every guy can definitely attest to. And so, if some of these things happen too much, then they become tropes and they become boring. Okay, so the next three rules I pretty much just lumped in all together since they all have to do with the same thing. Truancy. All wrestlers are due in the building one hour before the scheduled starting time of the show, with fines again being implemented for being late of $1,000 for the first offense, $2,500 for the second offense, and $5,000 and a breach of contract for the third offense. However, that rule has to do with being late for an event. What about not showing up at all? Missing an event except in the case of the most severe injuries is considered a breach of contract. The only excusable exception to this rule is an act of God. Yeah, I have to admit that sounds like a real extreme measure. What's the thinking behind this? Well, the next rule will answer that. Wrestlers who are injured and can't perform are still expected to make the town in order to show the fans that WCW will no longer falsely advertise talent. The only exception would be a crippling injury, which doesn't allow for traveling. Okay, so I get it, not wanting to falsely advertise is a good thing, but at the same time, card is still subject to change, and also making a wrestler who's banged up show up anyway does seem a little cruel. Talking over to PA during the show is to be discouraged. Lewd hand gestures are prohibited, as is cursing loud enough for the audience to hear. Oh, um, it's not what it looks like. Uh, anyway, I do have to admit the no talking over to PA thing does seem a little odd to me, but I'm sure there was a reason behind it. Moreover, when it comes to the second part of this rule, as well as, well, all the rules that we're talking about here today, a lot of it was nothing new, especially during the older times when people had different sensibilities. Okay, in terms of using lewd hand gestures and profanity, obviously enough, we can understand why that was a problem. Even if it was a major factor of how Stone Cold Steve Austin got over in the Attitude Era. Man, it was awkward watching him just waving at WrestleMania instead of giving the finger like you know he wanted to. Fraternization between heels and baby faces in public is not acceptable. This includes traveling together to and from the arena, to public appearances, restaurants, and even to the gym. This also includes faces and heels, social together in social situations and the gym. Again, this is another one that's all about trying to preserve kayfabe. After all, if you have two wrestlers who are supposed to be feuding, then they probably shouldn't be chilling at the bar somewhere together. 
Although, as simple as this may seem, it does bring up a whole host of other problems. Like where Eric Bischoff pointed out that by having heels and faces needing to travel separately, that means you would have to double book flights. But allegedly, that might have been part of the goal, as it has been said that Watts didn't want all of his talent traveling on the same airplane just in case there was an issue. That way, if something happened to a flight, at least there were other people who could have wrestled. Now, as sound as that reasoning may be, there is another problem with it that Eric Bischoff would go on to point out. And it's the simple fact that what job has the right to tell its employees who they can and cannot hang out with? Oh, and also let's remember that they're independent contractors, not actual employees. Oh, and also, in some situations, trying to keep heels and faces away from each other can be rather difficult. For example, Sting and Lex Luger owned a gym together, so... How exactly would you go about explaining that one? No guests are allowed in the dressing room, including family members, media, etc. Okay, so this rule I'm gonna go ahead and tie to the next rule since both of them are kind of on the same wavelength. Each wrestler is allowed only two complimentary tickets to each show for friends and family. Any number of tickets above that number must be purchased at face value by the wrestler. Wrestling as a show has always struggled between two ideals. One, the visual of a packed wrestling audience filled to capacity, and also the idea of making money. Is it better to give away tickets that way you can have the appearance of a full arena? Or does this put you in jeopardy of having locals expecting that free tickets are going to pop up? Up, and therefore conditioning them to think that wrestling shows are free. Not only that, but another problem that ties back into the last rule that we were just talking about is that some of the family and friends who would get comp tickets and go backstage began to feel a little entitled and perhaps a little too big for their britches as they started suggesting things like finishes and how to book a match. And if you're in charge of a wrestling promotion, one of the last things you want to hear is how to run your business from some mark that you gave a free ticket to. Well, there you go, the 10 controversial rules of Bill Watts in WCW. Where do you stand on each of these rules? Let me know down in the comments, and please make sure that you're subscribed to this channel if you like content just like this, and also because it helps me get to my goal of getting that silver play button. I really, really want it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and thank you to all my awesome Patreons out there, and as always, Dave knows.